Hello and welcome to this video for TES. I'm Helen Amas, I'm the Assistant Features Editor here, and I'm joined today by Behaviour Guru Bill Rogers. Um, and he's going to talk us through uh, some strategies that you might use to tackle uh, everyday issues in the classroom. Good, thank you very much. We'll just delete the guru, but uh, <laughs> if you look up here, this is a teacher just relaxing over a cup of tea or coffee and he's thinking about his, or if I draw a female colleague, uh, her class, and just thinking about some of the issues they face every single time they work with a new class, particularly in the first few meetings. And it's in those first few meetings with a new class that often the behaviour issues come to the fore. And one of the most basic things we face as teachers, particularly in more challenging schools, is class restlessness at the beginning of the lesson. For example, several students may be calling out, some with their hands up, some just calling out, some waving. There may be two or three students chatting while the teacher's trying to help the class settle by what they say and, and, and get the class focused. Maybe kids are fiddling with objects. It could be everything from a pencil case to a loud water bottle. Uh, it could be even secreted makeup or a phone that they're trying to sneakily text on. And when we're helping a class to settle, in terms of whole class, uh, when we're initiating and sustaining some kind of focus and attention, it really, really is important to have a sense of calmness and no arrogance, but a sense of confidence, so no cockiness or arrogance there at all. And what we say at that point to enable that calmness and focus is really, really important. For example, some teachers will say things like, can you please be quiet? Will you please stop talking? Can you please face the front? What did I just say to a child who's not paying attention? Questions like this are not helpful because they're, they're we're not asking their permission, you know, would you please face the front, can you stop talking? We need to give confident and respectful directions to the class, something like this. So when we're scanning the faces of our students, once they've finally got in their seats, and that may take a little bit of time for some classes, we stand at the front of the classroom as we scan the class and say something like this. All right, settling down everyone, settling down things. We want to settle, look, and face the front. So they're the key messages we're trying to get across. All right, settling down, thanks. And because several kids are calling out, instead of taking those questions, we'll, say, we'll add something like this. A number of students are still chatting and calling out. I'll take your questions later, hands down for now, and facing the front. So we're giving brief cues to the behavior we expect. We're not asking the four or five kids who are calling out, why are you calling out, or you shouldn't be calling out. And when, the girl, when four or five students are chatting, I nearly said girls, but I mean anybody chatting, we'll also say something like this, a number of you are still chatting, you do need to be facing this way and listening, thank you. If students have got their chairs away from the table, just bring your chairs in, thanks. If any student is, has got his back to us or side on, Bring your chair right around, thanks. Bring your chair right around, face this way, ta. And even the incidental thanks or ta in those half a dozen cueings is not, in, is not accidental. Thanks is more expectation than please. We're not actually giving a request. Every class I've ever worked in where there's been a very restless class like this, that confident, respectful cueing we're not speaking in a fast voice or a loud voice, but a, a confidently respectful voice. Generally takes two or three minutes, sometimes a little bit longer, for, the, for that confidence to be um, responded to by the students and the calmness we're exercising to be responded to. And the students do face a front. Some of them might be frowning because you've said hands down for now and eyes and ears this way. I will take your questions later. They need to be reassured of that. So it takes two or three minutes, and by this time the class, what you've said and how you've said it, and the way you're scanning the class, allowing a little bit of brief take up as you connect with some of those eyes in the room, normally there is a reasonable settling. And at that point, and only at that point, will we say good morning. 
We won't say good morning or good afternoon through significant restlessness. But once they're settled, good morning everyone or good afternoon. You're much more relaxed now. And then we start the activity. Now, when we start to talk about what we're doing, if students are still calling out, Mr. Rogers, or what did you say again? If they're calling out like that, we'll focus on those two or three students. And when we do that, we'll very briefly cue the rest of the class, because they've got to put up with us. Excuse me for a moment, everyone. Shannon and Bill L, it's hands up, thanks, without calling out. I'll take your questions later. Right now, you need to be facing this way. So even there, there's a very brief descriptive cue, you're calling out, and a brief and positive directional cue, you need to be facing this way and listening, thanks. If several students are still chatting, we'll cue them in as well. Excuse me for a moment, class. Melissa and Chantel, you are still chatting. And that brief descriptive cue raises the awareness of these students. We're not asking them why they're chatting, or equally pointless, are you still talking? But a very brief cue to raise their awareness, you're still chatting, you need to be facing this way and listening, thanks. You need to be facing this way and listening is the directional part of the cue. And at that point, because it's just two or three students now, once we've given that cue, we take our eyes off them and refocus back to the group, as if to say to these students we've just spoken to, I finished what I needed to say briefly and respectfully. The ball is respectfully back in your court and it conveys the expectation of cooperation or at the very least compliance. If two or three, three students are fiddling with something like the window blinds, again, we'll use a brief descriptive cue and a brief directional cue. Excuse me for a moment, class. Uh, Ch Chantel and Tiffany and Bill are you fiddling with the window blinds. Leave the blind saints and face this way too. Again, because I want to leave the blinds and face this way, we use directions focused on the behaviour we expect. If I just say don't fiddle with the window blinds or don't talk when I'm talk, uh, trying to teach or don't call out, or don't lean back in your chair, I'm only asking the kids or directing the kids to what I don't want them to do rather than what I fairly and reasonably ought to expect them to do. None of this is easy. None of this is easy at all. And it requires a sense of um, confident focus, but no arrogance at all, and a voice and a manner that conveys that expectation to the class and obviously to the individuals. And when you look at the um, distribution of behaviour in the class, it's a small percentage, maybe about 10%, 15%, who tend to be the more fractious, attentionally fractious, or are challenging students. When we behave that way, with, with a confident, respectful sense of language, the responsible, cooperative kids come on board very, very quickly, which makes it easier to work with the less responsive and more attentionally demanding students. And the other thing that's important to remember is when I speak to those two or three students who are chatting while the rest of the class are basically settling, once we've said something to them like you're still chatting, you do need to be facing this way and listening, thanks, and you might even add without chatting, that when we take our eyes off them to convey take up time to these students, it's not uncommon that they'll sigh or pout or raise their eyes to the ceiling like that. And with that aspect of the behaviour, that secondary, residual secondary behaviour, the sighing, the rolling of the eyes, if you watch an effective teacher, at that point, that non-verbal sulkiness and frowning is what we tactically ignore as we refocus to the class. We don't need to add, don't sigh about it and don't frown when I'm talking to you. Because if we over-service that attentional, insecurity in these students, it just makes it more difficult because we can always speak to them privately later if we need to. They're just some of the ways in which we seek to establish ourselves with a positive sense of behaviour leadership in those critical first meetings. In a school that's very supportive uh, of its colleagues, we do a lot of work about 
how we use language in the classroom, particularly when we're addressing distracting and disruptive behaviour. What I've just talked about are not serious disruptions. They're annoying and frustrating, and we do need to address them to get a sense of focus in the class. Sometimes there are much more serious issues where we have to use quite assertive language, uh, not confrontational or aggressive language, but when we're addressing um, high levels of resistance or challenging behaviour or swearing behaviour or even abusive behaviour. And in a collegially supportive school, when we address that in the public space, we will always follow that up with the student later. We'll even at times need to use time out where we um, direct the student to leave the classroom in an appropriate way to a time out place. And certainly within 24 hours, what respectful teachers do, while they have to address those challenging behaviours in the public place of the classroom, will always follow that up with the student, with a senior teacher helping them to engage in appropriate consequences, but also some restitutional understanding once the student and the teacher have had time to calm down. The key to all of this is that if there is a, a key, and that, that is that strong uh, sense of colleague support where teachers are genuinely supported and not in any sense feeling insecure or inadequate because they're asking for the support that we all need to make the issue of uh, teacher leadership and particularly behaviour management and behaviour leadership work for us and the students. So thanks for your time and thanks for TES giving me this opportunity to share with you. Thank you. Thank you Bill and thank you for watching. Yeah.